and uh, good evening all of you first of all uh, all the speakers i welcome all the speakers uh, to the 79th aioc 2021 virtual international conference and uh, to to get started with the session i would request uh, moderator sir and um, our first speaker of the session uh, dr siddharth agarwal uh, to unmute the mic switch on the, uh, yeah sir your uh, camera is already switched on and uh, to start your presentation thank you so much sir over to you sir right good evening everyone am i audible yes sir you are okay so uh, i'm extremely thankful to professor martin dr sonal and dr jason for giving me this opportunity i would be speaking on the basic steps of strabismus examination the questions to be answered at the end of examination are whether the patient that we are dealing with actually has strabismus if it is strabismus then what kind of strabismus we are dealing with we must have an idea of the refraction visual acuity and the binocularity of the patient at the end of the examinations and we should also have an idea about whether we would be able to manage the patient ourselves or we need to refer the patient to a higher center for appropriate management i would not be covering specific questions related to surgical planning in this present the examination of the patient can be broadly divided into three groups one would be the assessment of vision and refraction second would be the motor examination and the sensory examination and as can be seen that not many equipments are required for the basic examination in strabismus so all attempts must be made to have an assessment of the visual acuity of the child a small child may require instruments like optokinetic drum or a preferential looking chart and slightly older children would be better off once they are explained the e chart and eventually the school children would cooperate on the smell and chart refraction must be performed under adequate cycloplegia the choice of the cycloplegic agent would depend on the age of the child and the race of the child observing the pupillary reflex is a very useful tool wherein an asymmetrical reflex as can be seen in the lower photograph or an unhealthy reflex gives us significant information about the patient it is also useful to observe the deviation under cycloplegia as when the patient is under cycloplegia the accommodative effort is gone this is the time to perform retina examination and to assess the fixation of the patient and should amblyopia be suspected attempt must be made to rule out all the other causes of poor vision and also to quantify amblyopia coming on to the motor examination all three components of the anomalous head posture the face turn the head rotation and the chin elevation or depression should be noted Hirschberg's test gives us an idea of the type of deviation and also the amount of deviation, which is eventually covered, uh, confirmed by the cover test and the cover uncover test, which I would be covering in the next slide. There's a small video to clarify it, and the uh, deviation is confirmed with the prism and cover test. An important point to note is that the child should be fixing at a target. which could be the an accommodative target mounted onto the spectacle frame of the examiner as can be seen in the photograph subjective tests in patients who complain of diplopia like the head charting may be performed and it is important to eliminate the head posture by performing these tests a note must be made of the limitation in ocular move, movements firstly the versions are tested and once the a motility limitation is noted on versions it is confirmed on ductions 
and finally the vergences should be tested to complete the motor examination this is a small video to demonstrate the cover test the examiner first covers the fixing eye to elicit fixation movement in the non fixing eye without and with the glasses to measure the deviation prisms are then placed over the fixing eye and they are gradually increased till no movement is noted this gives us an idea of the amount of deviation in the sensory examination diplopia chart is a very useful tool and should be performed in patients of incompetent deviations worth four dot test gives us an idea of the binocularity of the patient and the actual quantification of stereopsis is done on tests like the randot stereogram the beginners should watch out for gaze incompetence where the deviation is increasing in up gaze in this patient and there is an obvious inferior oblique overaction they should be wary of the motility limitations which could often be missed as the primary position the patient is almost straight they should be wary of the palpebral fissure abnormalities and the motility limitations and again very large deviations and cyclic deviations are best handled by the handled by the experts finally one needs to analyze and reexamine the findings of the examination and the complete examination may take 2 to 3 visits it is obvious that the strabismus examination should be performed with proper refractive correction in place and if we are giving the refractive correction on the first or the second visit the complete examination could be performed on the subsequent visits it is useful to perform the sensory examination before the motor examination because there is often disruption of fusion when you are performing the motor examination cover test and the cover and cover test are the basic foundations and all practitioners who intend to deal with strabismus patient should be confident about these two tests and the beginners should be watchful for gaze incompetence and motility limitations the photographs of this presentation were from my textbook on strabismus and i end with a big thank you i would be happy to take up any questions if there are any thank you thank you so much sir uh, are there any questions for the session Okay, so better if we take up questions together when we start the discussion. Dr. Frank Martin uh, would be the best to comment. He would be the. Okay, okay, sir. So shall we move ahead with our next speaker? Just a minute, Dr. Frank Martin may have something to say. Okay, yeah. okay, sir. No. No, no, no. Thank you very much. I think we'll leave the discussion till the end. I think it'd be good if the panelists joined in a discussion at the end of the session. So, so let's we'll can move on to the next speaker. Thank you. And uh, is that that's going to be uh, Rohit Saxena? Yes, a very well known strabismologist, inter locally and internationally. Thank you. uh i think we can go on with the presentation thank you so yes sir you can start your presentation yes so my screen is visible yes sir, yes, sir. thank you thank you uh thank you professor martin uh for the opportunity and uh I would be discussing on decision making in squint surgery 
and how we can try to get the balance right in getting the eye movements and the deviation correction. So before we start the cutting procedure, it's always important that we should be careful because sometimes, as we'll see, looks can be a bit deceptive. It's been talked about uh, by Dr. Siddharth, refraction is a key intervention. It's always important to look at the refraction, look at the records. Sometimes age-appropriate cycloplegic refraction has not been done and you can miss a partially accommodative esotropia or you can call a partially accommodative esotropia, which may be truly a complete accommodative esotropia. So it's very important to do an age-appropriate cycloplegic refraction. Many think that it's only accommodative esotropia that have the need for refraction. It's extremely important to know that divergent squints also need a very proper refraction, although not for accommodative control, but for the quality of vision that they have. So many IDS children may just fuse if a good quality refractive correction is given to them and a good quality image forms, which helps in the fusional mechanism and the control. Always check for amblyopia before you operate. It's very important to intervene for amblyopia before any surgical intervention is done. Otherwise, the parents often lose interest and you, of course, have wasted time, precious time, which can help in correcting a subnormal vision or a lazy eye. Always treat amblyopia appropriately. We are lucky now that a lot of interest and a lot of options are now appearing for management of amblyopia. But we always know that kids are more smarter than us. So just be careful. Always educate the parents and those who are closely associated with the child about appropriate amblyopia therapy. Often orbital lesions can present as acquired squints or any acquired squint should always raise a red flag. This was a patient who presented with an acquired Brown syndrome because of a cysticercosis in the muscle belly, superior oblique muscle belly. So it's very important in cases of acquired strabismus to do a thorough examination, identify the cause and manage that before you think of surgical correction of the strabismus. Always ask for and beware of variability. History of diurnal variation can easily be missed and we have learned by burning our fingers that myasthenia gravis is the biggest mimicker and can present in any possible way. So this patient presented with an acquired elevation deficit and it was a myasthenia that was responsible for this. Before you take your decision making, be sure of your diagnosis. Always be sure to differentiate between duans and six nerve palsy. Very frequently get children referred for six nerve palsy, get a lot of investigations and radio imaging done when it is a duance to start with. A, a kind of dictum I tend to follow is a congenital six nerve palsy is extremely rare. It's almost a duance unless proved otherwise. Congenital unilateral six nerve palsy more likely to be a duance. Again, pseudoesotropia is often mothers, parents, mother-in-laws extremely worried about the child having a squint. So always be careful, repeatedly examine the child. Now with phones, Ask the parents to take photographs with a flash and see for the corneal light reflex. If, it's, if the light reflex is centered, even when the child is looking on the side, you know you're looking at a pseudoesotropia. But keep the child in follow-up. There is nothing that precludes pseudoesotropias from later on presenting with acquired uh, accommodative esotropias or even infantile esotropias. The factors that affect our decision-making would be angle kappa. So look at angle kappa. Look at either eye fixating at the distance to see what is the possible angle kappa. Look at adenexal relationships, epicanthal folds, hypertelorism. Look for eye movements, both versions and ductions, and for any limitations that need to be corrected intraoperatively. Therefore, FTT is a must before you take a decision. And what is your final plan? It's a cosmetic outcome or a functional outcome, whether you're planning to overcorrect or undercorrect, and of course, associated oblique overactions. Deepening procedures, the most common is a graded recession, although there are many alternatives to that. And of course, uh, tenotomy, tenectomies for the oblique have been uh, are very popular, not, uh, not at all for the recti, and same marginal myotomies for the inferior oblique. There are limits for the maximum recession or resection you can do. So always be careful for the limits. Less than the minimum amount, it is very ineffective and you don't get much of an effect. And beyond 
the maximum recommended for conventional surgery, you're going to have an cross underaction that will create limitation of movement in horizontal gazes. Problems of excessive recession would be palpable aperture changes, unilateral underaction of muscles causing diplopia and that gaze of action, and decreased excursion of the globe in circadian velocities. Strengthening procedures, the most common for recti are graded resections, although advancement is possible in a previously recessed muscle. Tucking or double breasting is uh, recommended for superior oblique, although the alternative for resection, now plications for recti muscles are also increasingly very popular for their speed and the lack of or the reduced severity of reaction, swelling, edema in the post-op period. Again, maximum limits of resection. Don't go beyond the recommended because then you're actually cutting away myofibrils and which is weakening the muscle rather than strengthening beyond a point. There are gross nomograms for primary surgeries and many of these nomograms have been created by expert surgeons over a long time with their experience. We use these nomograms as we start our surgical procedures, but over time you can actually see how your surgical outcomes are different from those that are recommended and might be you might require to adjust your nomograms ever so slightly. Bilateral recessions versus unilateral resect is a long-standing discussion with really no conclusion. It's difficult to uh, perform a bilateral recession in an adult if you have to do under local anesthesia like we usually do for adults. And therefore, we prefer unilateral recess resect also the additive effect that unilateral surgery gives us. So a large angle, think in more, more in terms of unilateral surgery to get greater correction of the deviation. Other important points that recessions are stronger than resections. Response to the medial rectus is more in almost a three to two ratio to the lateral rectus. And therefore there are again some gross ideas that per millimeter effect correction gives you the amount of prismatic correction on a surgical procedure. So we also know that if you do one eye, you get virtually 25% more effect. So an RNR procedure would give you a much more uh, correction of deviation as compared to bimedial recessions or bilateral recessions. You get almost 25% greater effect in infants as compared to adults. And even in older children, there may be up to 10% additional effect compared to adults. Important points to remember is do not induce incompetence. In a competent squint, that's why it is important to remain within the limits of described competent surgery. Larger amounts will cause deficient ductions and palpable of aperture changes. If you have to do large, correct large deviations, divide the surgery between the two eyes and always be consistent. Other factors would be age. Like we said, it's more uh, effective in younger patients. Patients respond. So a previous surgery in the other eye can help you if the response was less than what was expected, you may require to slightly over, overdo the amount of surgery you do. Anatomical variations, previous surgery, larger deviations give you more response per millimeter recession or resection. So you may get a greater response from, from 6 mm recession to 7 mm recession versus 3 to 4 mm change. So it's important to remember that larger deviations can give you more response. And finally, what is the sensory state of the patient? And when you are planning surgeries, you always need to know whether you can do bilateral or you may have to do unilateral surgeries and what are your desired results. Variations per surgeon also factor in by placement of sutures, exposure of muscles, amount of dissection done. That's why two different surgeons may have an entirely different effect for the same amount of surgery done because we are always having minor differences amount in the amount of dissection we do. The the cutting of the check ligaments, the intermuscular septum, and particularly more so with vertical recti, where you have to be careful about the obliques that are associated with the vertical recti. But there is a lot of movement towards the phonics incision, which is, uh, which is faster, has less bleeding, although there are no differences in outcome, but phonics incision requires a little more expertise as compared to the limbal incision. And if you are a beginner, then probably limbal incision with its clean anatomy would be far better. Uh, these are, of course, outcomes that sometimes make a difference in amount of your decision. So like intermittent exos, we sometimes in adults want to overcorrect mildly so that we can catch the exotropic drift that these patients have. But then, of course, that is on a case-to-case -case basis. Always measure a &D patterns because you need to be able to correct for oblique overactions. And if there are no oblique overactions, you need to shift the recti 
so that the A and B patterns can be corrected. Botulinum toxin for early rehabilitation is a very good idea, particularly for six nerve palsies, where you can get very good outcomes in the post-op period. The eye to be operated, sometimes the patient might feel you're doing the wrong eye, but just like in a case of third nerve with aberrant innervation, you can see that there is a lid elevation on adduction, which can be used if you operate the other eye. Same eye surgery would not get you that lid elevation because of the fixation durus kind of effect that the other eye surgery would have, and you can correct the process along with the third nerve. Importance of eye movements is there because you need to decide whether there is any limitation of movement that needs to be corrected. So this was a case of post-orbitotomy, partially recovered six nerve palsy. You can see good movements have recovered. We did a large RNR procedure and you got good results. However, if there is limitation of movement, like in this case of a six nerve palsy, you can see that the abduction is almost not there. A severe abduction deficit, no amount of recess resect procedure is going to give you good results. So a transposition procedure was necessary. We did an adjustable MR recession along with a half muscle width vertical recti transposition. So basically, when you are deciding to operate, although things can be confusing, there is no alternative to a good workup, correct diagnosis, and realistic expectations because it's always important to be prepared for the complicated and difficult post-op questions that the patient may have. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Rohit, uh, Rohit, for those very wise words. We'll uh, have a lot to discuss later. And our next speaker will be Julia Start. She's from Sydney, Australia. Julia will speak on when to investigate childhood strabismus. Thanks, Julia. Uh, uh, Dr. Julia, could you unmute, please? Ah, yes, thank you. Thank you, Professor Martin, and thank you for having me to speak today. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'd like to speak today on a topic that I think gives a lot of general and indeed paediatric ophthalmologists um, that they find difficult at times, and hopefully this talk will give you some tools to help you with your decision making. So when I'm teaching our trainees about paediatric ophthalmology, I try to get them to frame their management plan based on around these four key principles that you see on the slide. So the first is to identify and treat any life or eye-threatening pathology. The second is to put a clear image on the retina, and that usually means correcting refractive error. Equalize the vision in each eye, and that's your amblyopia treat treatment, and optimize ocular alignment where possible. So essentially, there's no point addressing the point below if you haven't addressed the one above. And this talk is really all about addressing the first point here. And of course, in paediatric ophthalmology, I find myself constantly worried that I'm missing a brain tumour in children. Um, but in fact, it's really quite rare to have strabismus as the only presenting sign of a brain tumour. And when I was trying to write this talk and looking for cases to include, uh, I've asked around our orthoptic staff who have been working at the Children's Hospital at Westmead in Sydney for 20 years, and they really struggled to think of a case where strabismus was the only presenting uh, feature initially. So that's somewhat reassuring. Now, I think it was Professor Martin who told me once that during my training that the difference between paediatric and adult ophthalmology is that in adults, it's easy to elicit the signs, but it's harder to know what to do. Uh, whereas in paediatrics, it's much harder to elicit the signs, but once you do, it's easy to know what to do. And I think this is really the point that I want to get across in this talk, that if you can elicit all the typical signs of a childhood strabismus syndrome, and of course you have to know what they are, <laughs> and confidently rule out all the red flags, then you can safely not investigate any further. So the first question to ask yourself is, does this fit a typical childhood strabismus syndrome? Does it have the typical features and have, is it following the typical natural history? Do you have typical examination findings? Is this a well child with no red flags? And are they responding to treatment in the way that you would expect? Now, what do I mean by no red flags? Regression of developmental milestones, and neurological symptoms such as headache, weakness, seizures, behavioural change and clumsiness. Now, 
these are all important questions to specifically ask parents because often if they have noticed something subtle, they won't necessarily tell you about it because they may not realise that that's even related to their eye problem, to their child's eye problem. Ophthalmic red flags to look out for in strabismus are unexplained poor vision, and this is a really important one. Um, as I think was mentioned in at the very first talk by Dr Agarwal, making sure that children are tested with an age-appropriate vision test is extremely important, and that follows as you follow the patient along. So they might start out when, you first, when they first come to see you with um, preferential looking tests, but as they grow and age and become more mature, they should be upgraded to a more mature visual acuity test. And so it's important that that is being followed up because often if it's not and a child is actually regressing or has neurological symptoms, they may not be graduating to the next test, um, the next age appropriate test. And so you may think that their vision is stable, but actually it's there's unexplained poor vision there. So just an important point to keep in the back of your mind. ROPD or relative afferent pupillary defect, ptosis, variability of the squint, unexplained nystagmus, double vision, disswelling and retinal changes are some of the key ophthalmic red flags to look out for. So what do I not investigate? These are the classic, I think, uh, group of childhood strabismus syndromes that you really should have a good idea of, of, of what they look like and what the classic features are. So if I have a patient that fits into one of these categories neatly and they're a well child and there are no red flags and they're responding to treatment in the way I'd expect, then I don't investigate them. So just to give you a quick example, a baby presents to you at 11 months of age with a large constant esotropia who appears to cross fixate and has equal vision. They're a well baby, they're growing and developing as you'd expect, and they've got all the features of infantile esotropia and you'd want to diagnose, diagnose them as infantile esotropia. However, mum tells you that the turn only developed at nine months of age and she pulls out her phone and you go back through the 40,000 photos on her phone of the child and you really can't prove that the turn was there before six months of age. Now that doesn't fit the definition of infantile esotropia and I really think you're, in, you're obliged to, to further investigate this child with an MRI of their brain. So what do I always investigate? As I've already said, any atypical features or red flags? any strabismus that fits a typical neurological pattern. So things like dorsal midbrain syndrome or internuclear ophthalmoplegia, it's important to know the features of these because there's a high incidence of um, intracranial pathology with these strabismus patterns. Any sudden onset acquired cranial nerve palsy in a child, and this includes a post spiral six nerve palsy, and I, I may have colleagues out there that disagree with me on this, but I would investigate these cases. A constant exotropia in children under two. Um, of course, you have to rule out, make sure that they have normal vision and a normal ocular exam to rule out a sensory cause of an exotropia. But I don't necessarily scan these patients straight away, but I will refer them to a paediatrician for a neurodevelopmental assessment because there's a high, incident, a high association in, in exotropia in this age group with systemic syndromes such as cerebral palsy. And there may be subtle signs there that the paediatrician will pick up that haven't been picked up previously. Any variable signs, especially with fluctuating ptosis, I'll investigate for myasthenia gravis, as I think was mentioned in the previous talk. Any traumatic or restrictive strabismus, I think should be further investigated. Uh, acquired Brown syndrome should be investigated and this should include inflammatory bloods. And the last one I think is the most tricky one, the acquired non-accommodative esotropia. This is the one that I think we all find difficult sometimes to know whether to investigate or not. And look, some of the signs to look out for, which might make you more inclined to scan a patient, are no prior period of intermittency or of an, of an intermittent uh, esotropia no history of interruption to fusion. Now that might be, an example of that would be patching. Uh, an onset in a child five years or more, double vision, distance angle greater than near, an A pattern, esotropia, uh, lack of fusion on a synoptophore. Now that's tricky to get in a young child, but it might be useful in an older child. And the absence of significant uncorrected refractive error 
and that can be hypermetropia or myopia. So these are some of the things to look out for when you're trying to make a decision. So this case, I think, highlights some of these points. This was a five-year-old girl who was out in the backyard playing Let's Go Cross-Eyed with her friend. And immediately thereafter, she came into the kitchen and mum noticed a small convergent strabismus, which was constant and stayed that way for a week. Uh, after a while, it started to get more noticeable and, and the angle started to get larger. And so mum presented with her child to an ophthalmologist. She had no prior period of intermittency and there were lots of old photos to confirm this. So this squint was definitely not there in any way, shape or form before this acute episode. And she was an otherwise very fit and healthy young girl with no neurological signs or symptoms and certainly no double vision. Her visual acuity for distance and near was normal for her age. She had a 35 prison diopter left esotropia, which was comitant and equal for distance and near. Her ductions were full. Her pupils were normal. Her anterior and posterior segment examination was also normal. And she definitely didn't have disc swelling. A cycloplegic retinoscopy was performed and she had plus 1.5 uh, diopters of hypermetropia in both eyes, which is really not significant, but for what it was worth, we trialled a pair of glasses to see if it made any difference to the uh, strabismus. However, concurrently, we also ordered an MRI of her brain in orbits with contrast. So I think the key feature here even though there's no disc swelling, even though this is a well child with no neurological features, were that there was no prior period of intermittency of the squint and there was a lack of significant refractive error. So this is her MRI. And as you can see, she has a large posterior fossa cerebellar tumor with some obstructive hydrocephalus. And it turned out to be a pilocytic astrocytoma. So this young girl went, underwent successful complete excision and postoperatively her eyes are straight and she has 6 6 vision in both eyes and normal stereo acuity. So it's a very good outcome really. So what scan do I order? Now, obviously you have to weigh up the pros and cons of CT versus MRI and I'm sure most of you out there are familiar with these pros and cons. CT obviously is fast and accessible. It's less, there's less claustrophobia. It's less affected by a motion artifact, uh, but unfortunately there are high doses of ionizing radiation. MRI on the other hand is very slow. It often requires a general anesthetic in a young child, which means it can be incredibly difficult to uh, access. And certainly we find this in Sydney, it's very difficult to access MRI under general anesthesia but there is no ionizing radiation and there's certainly better soft tissue detail. So where possible, I always order an MRI, but I appreciate that accessibility is different uh, in different parts of the world. And really you have to sort of make the best decision that you can based on what uh, resources you have available. So my top tips for when to scan strabismus our old photographs and videos. We live in an age where every parent has an iPhone or some sort of device and thousands of videos and photographs. They're extremely helpful to prove the timing of onset of these uh, strabismus syndromes and also to prove that there is a strabismus sometimes when you can't see it in your office uh, when it's an intermittent strabismus. Foster a good relationship with your local friendly paediatrician because sometimes when you're just not sure whether to get a scan or not, it can be really helpful to get uh, a bit of systemic information or a systemic assessment on the child to help you make your decision. Normal optic nerves do not exclude a brain tumour. And I think this, the case that I described uh, made that point quite clearly. And follow up on your patient. Make sure they're responding to treatment if you haven't decided to further investigate. Make sure they respond to treatment in the way you expect and look for evolving signs. Uh, you can always change your mind on whether to scan. And just make sure that you ask a specific question on MRI when on your MRI or CT request form because that really helps the radiologist. And don't be shy to talk to the radiologist if it's reported as normal, but you're still concerned. So look, I hope that's been helpful. And again, it's been a real pleasure to talk here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julia. You've covered a, a lot of information very clearly. We'll talk about it later on. Our next speaker is Fethi Mehmed from Indonesia, 
that he will speak on management of accommodative esotropia. Uh, good evening. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to thanks to Professor Frank Martin, to Dr. Sonal and Dr. Jason for giving me the opportunity in this session. Uh, can you hear me? Ye yes, thank you. Thank you. So uh, I will talk about the management of partially accommodative isotropia. Accommodative isotropia is a convergent deviation of the eyes associated with activation of the accommodation reflex. Onset usually between age two and three, they try to accommodate to clear the retinal image blur and often with positive family history, maybe intermittent at onset associated with amblyopia, generally from an isometropia, may be precipitated by trauma or illness, and often seen in patients with a moderate to high hypropia, usually plus three to seven diopter, average plus four. There are three types of accommodative isotropia. Firstly, accommodative isotropia, refractive, Maybe we'll, we'll be talked by uh, Dr. Vila later. And the second type is accommodative isotropia with high ACA ratio, can manage by bifocal glasses. And the third is partially accommodative isotropia, can be managed to component management. Then I will talk about the partially accommodative isotropia. This is uh, one patient with refractive accommodative isotropia associated with high hypropia. In this, uh, in this picture without glasses, we can see the isotropia. And after the glasses full corrected, uh, they uh, see, uh, see the orthotropia. So the second is non-refractive accommodative isotropia, usually mild hypropia with high ACA ratio. And isotropia is greater for near than that for distance, fully corrected by bifocal glasses with 8 plus 3 diopter for near vision. And this is partially accommodative isotropia. Isotropia is caused by high hypropia with normal ACA ratio, deviation that responds only partially to spectacle correction. Management of partially accommodative isotropia by full correction spectacles for hypropia and residual isotropia or non-accommodative portion of the deviation can manage by surgery. I have two cases with partially accommodative isotropia. The first case, uh, actually, this uh, these children has uh, had a history of the isotropia uh, from uh, three years old. Old uh, now, see eight years old girl uh, with isotropia with visual acuity on the right eye. Uh, with plus four uh, is 2020, and the left eye with plus 4.5 is 2020. Prism alternative cover test without glasses uh, for near and for distant is same, is 55 prism diopter, and with glasses near and distant same, 35 prism diopter, and uh, worse in stereopsis. This the pictures uh, without glasses. We can see here the uh, isotropia, and after the glasses, still has isotropia in this child. And I manage by uh, surgery only in one eye with medial rectus recession in the left eye. This is the surgery. So I made the uh, fornix incision and, and then the identification of the muscles. And 
and then dissection then, and check of ligaments. Then make a suturing near at the insertion. And after that, cutting the muscles at the insertion. And then make a cautery for the bleeding. And make a reincision in seven millimeter posterior to the insertion. So this is the just post-surgery and then this is the post-operative day first. Uh, still esotropia without uh, glasses and this is orthotropia with glasses. And uh, I made the cover test in without glasses, they're still, sorry, still uh, Isotropia here and with glasses, no isotropia, but still has esophoria. Cover test, no movement. And this is one week post operative with orthotropia uh, in a prism alternative cover test near and distance, still had six. Uh, Prism diopter esophoria. And the second case is a five years old boy with esotropia since uh, since two years of back and visual acuity at the uh, in this patient in the right eye with plus uh, seven point five is 2020 and left eye with plus five is uh, 2020. And prism alternative uh, cover test without glasses for near and distance is large 80, but with glasses uh, near and distance same 50. No, stereo no stereopsis in this patient. Then I made a uh, treatment for this patient by spectacles and bilateral medial rectus recession. And this is the patient. This is after uh, the post-operative day one. This is without glasses, still had the isotropia, but after the glasses, uh, this is orthotropia. So at uh, conclusion, Onset of accommodative isotropia, usually between age two and three, and there are three types of accommodative isotropia. Refractive accommodative isotropia managed by spectacles, non-refractive accommodative isotropia managed by bifocal glasses with at three plus for near vision and partially accommodative isotropia managed by spectacles for accommodate accommodative portion and non-accommodative is corrected by surgery. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for that excellent presentation. And we'll continue on with accommodative esotropia, management of refractive accommodative esotropia, Patricia Villa from the Philippines. Thank you, Patricia. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Patricia Villa from the Philippines, and I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give a talk in this um, symposium. My topic for today will be management of refractive accommodative isotropia. 
and um, sorry, there. Just for some formalities, I have no financial interest in any of the products that will be mentioned in this lecture. So as mentioned earlier by Dr. Fetty, I'll just again redefine what accommodative isotropy is all about. It is a convergent deviation of the ice associated with the activation of the accommodation reflexes. And there are three kinds. We have the refractive accommodative isotropia, the partially accommodative isotropia, or the decompensated type, and the non-refractive or the high ACA ratio type of accommodative isotropia. But then for tonight, I'll just be discussing on the refractive accommodative isotropia. So just a quick review, what exactly is accommodation? This is actually a process by which the eye changes optical power to maintain a clear image on an object as its distance changes. So there is a reduction in the zonular tension induced by the ciliary muscle contraction, allowing the lens to round up and increase optical power. So when looking at a very near object, light rays from close objects diverge and require more refraction for focusing. So this is just a table that shows you the fusional vergence amplitude and the accommodative amplitudes that the eyes are capable of. And if you notice that the divergence fusional amplitude is much lesser compared to the convergence fusional amplitude. And as we get older, the accommodative amplitude becomes less and less. So what is refractive accommodative isotropia? As we are all familiar with, the onset is usually between six months to seven years of age and at the average age of 2.5 years. So they come to you at around this age, around two years old, three years old. And the, page, the parents would usually um, say or um, notice or observe that it, it starts intermittently. And as the child gets older, it becomes more constant. In terms of predisposition, it's either hereditary, genetic, and it's commonly associated with amblyopia because of the high hyperopic uh, changes in the lenses. And also, if there's a big difference between the right and the left eye, when the difference between the grade of the two eyes are, are wide apart, then this, is also, uh, this can also lead to amblyopia. Um, patients with refractive accommodative isotropia are of high hypermetropes, um, where in their grade ranges from plus two to plus seven with an average of 4.75 diopters. And isotropia is usually around 20 to 40 prism, uh, prism diopters. And the ACA ratio is normal. So in the process of accommodative isotropia, what happens? So when the uh, hyperopia is uncorrected, the, accommodate, the eyes tend to accommodate excessively just to make the image clearer. And this will stimulate overconvergence, straining the fusional divergence later on, which will eventually lead to the crossing of the eye. So now the relationship between hyperopia and isotropia are as follows. There's an increasing hyperopia before the onset of isotropia. And um, hyperopic children with accommodative isotropia is stable. And sometimes the grade just increases up to seven years of age. And later, as they get older, after seven, eight years old, the grade slowly goes down, which we, we all know as the myopic shift. So how do we approach accommodate, accommodative isotropia? We give the full hyperopic correction with the cycloplegic refraction. We check the alignment after one to two months when we get, once we give the spectacles. And we also need to check for the visual acuity, the stereopsis, the, the binocularity. And again, check alignment, check whether there is a remaining or a residual isotropia. If there's a residual isotropia, then we need to repeat the cycloplegic refraction and ask the patient to come back again with the new spectacles. Once on follow-up, check whether there's still the presence of isotropia. If there's isotropia for distance and near, then the patient has partially accommodative isotropia. But then if the isotropia is um, absent or the distance alignment is acceptable and the near deviation remains high, then the patient has a high ACA ratio. But if there is no isotropia, once the spectacles are given, then the patient has full refractive accommodative isotropia. 
So what about ACA ratio? This, this gives a relationship between the amount of convergence, which is the interning of the eyes, that is generated by a given amount of accommodation, which is the focusing effort. So for eyes to maintain fusion or binocularity, there has to be a balance between the central innervation controls for accommodation and convergence. Normal ACA ratio is around four to five is to one, and the imbalance leads to an abnormal ACA ratio. In patients with refractive accommodative esotropia, their ACA ratio is usually normal. These are patients who are high hypermetropics, and the esotropia is restored fully once the full hypermetropic correction is given at all fixation distances, whether near or far. And this is because it reduces the load of accommodation to clear retinal image, which will help align the eye once the spectacles are worn. So here's just a video on a patient without spectacles with a very high hyperopia of plus seven in both eyes. You can see that the eyes are deviating inwards as we do the alternate prism, uh, alternate cover test. Then now with full correction, with a full cycloplegic correction, the eyes are quite straight, orthotropic. There. So for the management, management is we give full cycloplegic hyperopic correction because as I mentioned earlier, it reduces the load of accommodation to clear retinal image, which will help align the eyes. So how do we instill cycloplegic agents? We get the full amount of hyperopia by either installing cyclopentylate or atropine. But I come from the Philippines and I deal with a lot of um, darkly pigmented irises. So my, 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 my choice of eye drop is atropine 1%. I put the drop twice a day for three days. Then I do the refraction on the fourth day. I also make sure that the patient does not have amblyopia once the spectacles are on, because if there's amblyopia present, we need to do amblyopia therapy. And it's important also as well to also remind the parents that the child needs to wear the glasses full time. No breaks in between, only during when they're taking their shower or when they're asleep. So what is the outcome in refractive accommodative isotropia? The outcome is quite good actually, and in terms of vision and binocular single vision. And there was a study that showed that sustained reduction of amblyopia was from 61.2%. It went down to 15.2% with the correction and binocular ocular function improved in 89.3% of, of the patient in one study. And, in a study um, published by WIC, around 90% improved binocular ocular function. Final stereopsis was compared with age of presentation and age at which motor alignment was achieved. It was found out that there were higher levels of stereopsis in those who had later presentation and higher grade of binocular vision is associated with late presentation rather than early de detection and treatment. Now for the stereopsis in patients with refractive accommodative isotropia, um, those in a study published by Heng in JPOS in 2017, um, those with orthotropia both at distance and near had better stereopsis than those with residual isotropia. So it's very important to make sure that the eyes are aligned once the spectacles are on because it was noted that patients with more than four prism diopters of deviation of isotropia at distance and more than five prism diopters of deviation at near had only gross to nil stereopsis. And for the refractive error, angle of deviation and fusional ability were associated with stereopsis in patients with refractive accommodative isotropia. And good isotropia is, was achievable with a misalignment of less than or equal to four prism diopters at distance and less than five um, prism diopters at near. So the target should always be orthophoric so that um, when we're running after the stereopsis, we can achieve at least an improvement in the stereopsis. So how do we gradually reduce hyperopia? Um, we have to take into consideration the amblyogenic age. So usually, um, in my, in my practice, I would usually reduce 
the hyperopic correction gradually at around 9 to 10 years old, around 0.5 to 75 prism diopters every 6 to 12 months, so that this will enhance or increase fusional divergence and maximize visual acuity. And in one study by Lambert, um, the spectacles were weaned out by 0.5, were weaned out by um, gradually decreasing the amount of hyperopia by 0.5 diopters increments until spectacles were discontinued or they developed isotropia, asinopia, or decrease in vision. So that's your, your, your cutoff. You need to, why, when you're weaning out the, the, the hyperopic correction, you have to make sure that there's still no isotropia, asinopia, or decreased vision because once this happens, then you have to stop from there. And the degree of baseline hyperopia appears to be one of the best predictors. So 91% of the patients, less than three diopters of hyperopia were successfully weaned out. However, when the grade was much higher, more than three diopters, only 22% of the patients were successfully weaned out. So what when we wean off the spectacles, majority of the children, even after the second decade of life, require a spectacle correction and factors associated with lower likelihood of spectacle discontinuation were prematurity and greater hyperopia. And in this study, the rate of spectacle discontinuation was around 8% after 5 years, 20% after 10 years, and 37% after 20 years. And when do we do surgery? Again, our, our goal is to to align the eye with the spectacle correction. However, if there is a residual isotropia, then the patient can undergo surgery. Or if the eye already has decompensated from a previously controlled deviation. So as a take home message, we should not delay when we manage refractive accommodative isotropia because we are running out of time. We do not want to lose that fusional ability. We do not want that patient to develop amblyopia or if ever amblyopia is there, we want to correct it right away. And we do not want the child to further lose the stereopsis. So here are my references and thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much for that presentation, Patricia. And the final presentation in the symposium will be on abduction disorders in China, a case presentation from Jiang Hu Yan. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Martin. Uh, thank you to the organizer for having me here today. Uh, my topic uh, is clinical case presentation of uh, abduction disorders in China. Uh, we all know uh, abduction disorder is caused by the six cranial nerve palsy. The six cranial nerve palsy is the most commonly affected oculomotor nerve in adults, and in children, it is the second. The many etiologies, such as diabetes, tumor, trauma, inflammatory, and so on. Today, we will talk about some special case presentations. Uh, this is the case one. The right eye cannot move outward and he has isotropia of the light eye. He's born with this and is stable. The deviation is stable. We look at like, look the peripheral facial. When the eye look to the left, the right eye, listen, becomes small. The peripheral laser is small. And when he look to the right side, the peripheral facial becomes normal. What's the diagnosis? Yeah, we all know it's the dune retraction syndrome. Uh, this is the, the type one dune syndrome. It's the limitation of abduction. Most of them is the type one. The type two is the limitation of adduction. 
and the type three is the limitation of both A deduction and A deduction. All of three types have global retraction and narrowing of the parabola spatial on A deduction. Yeah, this is the second case. He has uh, left R is a choppy and uh, A B duction deficit. What's the diagnosis? Yeah, look at his face. He has the seventh nerve, cranial nerve palsy also. He was born with this kind of situation and the deviation is stable also. This is the Mobius syndrome, categorized by abduction and facial nerve palsy. It may be unilateral or bilateral. Sometimes there are other uh, abnormalities such as craniofacial malformation, hypogrophia, limb anomalies, hearing loss, and mental retardation. Yeah, look at this child. He's about two years old. Boy. The abduction deficit of the right eye and the east jaw also. Yeah, look at the CT scan. The right medial rectus muscle is enlarged and the force deduction test show restrictive force of abduction of the right eye. Yes, is the congenital fibrosis of medial rectus muscle. Yeah, what's the diagnosis of this case? He's a middle-aged male and he had left his trophy of about three years and cannot move out of the left eye. Look at the picture. Seems he has a proptosis on both eyes and the have up eyelid retraction also, especially the left eye. Uh, look at the orbital CT scan and many extraocular muscles enlarged, including the medial rectus muscle of both eyes. Yes, this is the xylo related strabismus. What's the diagnosis of this case? He's a 58 old man. He had a history of eye trauma. He slipped down in the office. 11 years, 11 months ago, and the left eye, and the right eye cannot move outward. And there has a large isotropia also. Yeah, look at the orbital CT scan. He has a fracture, fracture of the right medial optic wall. The medial rectus enlarged and the posterior part of it, so he cannot move outward of the right eye. What's the diagnosis of this patient? He's a female, about 30 years old. In the prime position, he has no strabismus. But the right eye cannot move both outward and inward, especially the deficit of abduction of the right eye. When he look to the right or the left side, he has double vision. Yeah, we look at the MIR scan of the orbit. Yeah, look at the medial rectus of the right eye. It's greatly enlarged. 
including both the muscle belly and the tendon, the medial rectus muscle cause the palsy of the medial rectus and the restrictive force of the abduction of the right side. So he has both abduction and adduction deficit of the right eye is an acute orbital myositis of the right medial rectus muscle. This is the last case. Both eyes in the large isotropia and the hypertropia cannot move a little bit. Here's high myopia. Look at the CT scan of his orbit. Both, both eye were dislocated. So purely and laterally. Yeah, is the myopic strabismus fixus, also called heavy eye syndrome. It's categorized by progressive isotropia and hypertropia with limited abduction and subproduction. It usually occur in high myopic individuals with the axial length more than 27 millimeters. The mechanism is the superlateral dislocation of the myopic globe with displacement of both the superior rectus and the lateral rectus muscle. In summary, we have, I have three cases, all of them a special form of strabismus. The three congenital include during retraction syndrome, Mobile syndrome and the fibrosis of medial rectus. Three are uh, orbital diseases, including xylo related strabismus, fracture of the medial orbital wall, and orbital myositis of the medial rectus. The last one is heavy eye syndrome. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing those most interesting uh, cases with us. Uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all the speakers for participating and secondly, to thank them for keeping to time. So we now have plenty of time for discussion. In, in, in the symposium, we've learnt a lot. We've learnt how important it is to start with the basic examination, eliciting the signs, then to plan our surgery appropriately. And, and when things don't seem to fit, we need to investigate the, chi the child. We learned about accommodative isotropia that uh, here we can actually restore uh, binocularity by appropriate uh, prescription of glasses uh, and at times with surgery. And then uh, if we finished up learning about how important it is to look at the whole not the eyes part of the body. It's not, a, it's not an organ on its own. It's connected to the brain and it's part of the body. So we've got to think outside the box. This is why strabismus and pediatric ophthalmology are such uh, fascinating uh, subspecialties of ophthalmology to be involved in. Now, I'd just like to ask uh, a few questions. With accommodative visotropia, would either Fetty or Patricia comment, when you prescribe a bifocal, do you specify what sort of bifocal you'd like the, ch the child to have? Um, oh, sh should I comment? Yes, go ahead, either, either oh, or usually, both of you. Um, I, I, would, I would request the optician to to make an executive type bifocals where in the lower segment is straight, which will bisect slightly lower than the center of the pupil, not exactly on the pupil itself, but just a little bit lower, just enough for her, for the patient to be able to use the lower segment. Yeah, th thank you, because that's very important because if we don't specify that, the dispensing optician will give a, a tiny bifocal, which is quite useless to the child. It's very important to specify 
that's got to be in the pupil. Now, what about multifocals? Do you, do you think multifocals have a place in accommodative esotropia? Do you prescribe multifocal glasses? Oh, th these are like progressive, progressive. Yes, lenses. progressive. Yes, progressive focus. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, um, as my patients get get older, they become quite conscious about the the segment, the bisecting segment, crossing the pupil, and and in, in some some instances, I would give progressive lenses, but these are for much much older patients who are like um, turning into adulthood already. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. I. Uh, yes. And what about Fetty? Do you do you agree with all with that? Is that what you, your practice is also? Yeah. Uh, I never give the uh, multifocal glasses in the children, uh, Professor Frank Martin. I always do the bifocal by by uh, just Dr. Phila said before. Yeah. I never I never give. Yes, no, yes, because there is a trend and I think the extended focus ones, which are in the older children, because they don't like they look different and children like to look like their peers. Now now I'll ask you while you're there, Fetty. What do you do when a parent says to you, I, I don't want my child to wear glasses or contact lenses, I want an operation, and the child is wearing plus four in each eye, controlling their accommodative esotropia very well, and, they, and the parents demand surgery. What is your response? Uh, for the accommodative esotropia only, so I always... Uh, motivate the parents to uh, to wear the glasses for the children, uh, not for surgery. But uh, if like uh, partially, so uh, sometimes the parents uh, do not do the surgery, but I push to make a surgery be because the residual isotropia can be managed by uh, spectacles. Yeah, so the partial accommodative, you yeah, recommend but, surgery? Uh, yes. and the others uh, you just say no that's it all right thank you very much uh, now thank you. now let's ask julia uh, you know it's it's it, it's it's always difficult uh, whether to investigate or not investigate and uh and i agree with what you uh, completely with what you said that any, any sudden onset uh, cranial nerve palsy needs to be investigated. I know in some centres uh, they say, oh, well, if a six, uh, say it's a sudden onset six, it's probably viral, let's wait six weeks, see if it gets better. Uh, but the parents' question then to you is, doctor, if it's not a virus, what else could it be? How do you respond and what do you do? Well, look, I think that's the big dilemma and I think that's where you've got to decide how you're going to run your practice. Uh, look, I'm a parent now as well and I think if my child had an acute uh, acquired cranial nerve palsy, a six nerve palsy, I'd be sending them for a scan. So, I, look, perhaps I'm biased. Um, but I think it is very hard for parents to wait when the alternative diagnosis is a brain tumour. And I think you have to be upfront with parents. Some will be comfortable to wait the six weeks, I think. So you have to have a frank conversation with the parents and, and just judge what they're comfortable with. Thanks, Julia. And Julia, you made an excellent point that to speak to the radiologist uh, about the scans, not just accept the result, because uh, when they go back and look at it uh, after talking to you, they will pick things up. Which they had, which had been overlooked. I've experienced. I'm sure you have. I think that's right. I think that's right. And you'd, it's not always, especially in the public hospital system, it's not always the consultant radiologist that reviews your scan. Um, so it's always important to look at the scan yourself um, and and question a normal scan if you're really concerned. I think that's important. Thank you. Now let's let's talk a little bit about the abduction deficits that we. That was so beautifully presented by Jing Hua. Uh, you presented a, a number of cases, and the interesting thing was this congenital 
uh, uh, single muscle myositis, uh, which can be congenital or can be acquired, but often babies are born either an esotropia or a hypotropia. And uh, so it's, do you investigate all these children with it, with it, with the imaging, with the MRI? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I usually uh, investigate it with the orbital uh, CT or MRI. It's very important to examine the change of the muscle structure. Thank you. Yes, because, yes, because that, and they are, and how do you manage these? If, if you had to, if you had a child, a baby who's born with, say, a large esotropia, limitation of abduction, you've diagnosed uh, that there's, mice, there's been myositis and fibrosis. How are you going to manage this child? Uh, it's, it's usually, uh, as a whole child, is usually uh, uh, my, uh, uh, it's a stable, it's a stable one, it's not a uh, my status. Yeah. So, yeah, so uh, I usually uh, uh, observation about three months to six months. If there's no change of the deviation, I do surgery as, as, as early as possible. Good thing. Thank you very much. Now, we started off by I, talking. I had a point to add with regard to the uh, bifocal lenses in partially accommodative esotropia. So, uh, in partially accommodative esotropia, first, the non accommodative component should probably be taken care of by surgery, and then the bifocal should be yeah. prescribed because there's no point in just reducing the deviation and not eliminating it because just reducing the deviation by bifocals would not stimulate the binocularity. So yes. first the surgery should be done and then probably the bifocal lenses should be prescribed. Yeah. And now, I, yeah, now I think that's what the speakers were saying, it's both saying that, that the bifocals are, are, use, and are useless in partially accommodative but uh, Siddharth, while you're there, I, I think you made some excellent points in, uh, in the basic steps, especially the importance of doing an accurate refraction uh, bec uh, in, in, in children. And, uh, and refracting children is not easy. How do you, can you give us some tips on how do you manage the difficult child with the difficult parents? The... Uh the hold of the child, we try to have the child onto the lap of the, uh, of the parent and make the parent face the back towards us. So the child is in close proximity of the patient, he's looking behind and the parent's back is towards us but the child's face is towards us. That is a comfortable hold and uh, that allows a reasonable amount of uh, uh, allows us to sometimes succeed in it. Sometimes sedation is required, a mild sedation, uh, uh, an antihistaminic drug which has a mild sedative property can be used. Uh, if that also doesn't work, then in very tiny children, you may uh, require to give a stronger sedative. But a good refraction is probably the most important step in managing children with strabismus because at the time of refraction, the retina examination is also an integral part and there, there, there can't be a shortcut to it. It has to be done properly. So if the child is uh, not cooperative, then you have to sedate the child. Thank you. Sit out now. Uh, while we're on this infants with uh, infantile esotropia, uh, you, know, there, you know, we all want to try and operate on them as early as possible, but it can be very difficult to accurately measure the angle of strabismus with prism. Do you rely on the, are you happy to rely on, a, on the Bruckner uh, or do you want to have a very accurate prism bar measurement before you'll operate on an infant with uh, 
esotropia? Uh, prison bar is very often uh, very difficult to perform in small children. So if we wait for about the initial six months till the, we are able to have a reasonable idea uh, of the amount of the deviation. If we are still uncertain about the deviation, we've been using botulinum toxin more frequently till we are able to have a idea of the uh, deviation. That, that is a tool in our armamentarium in very small children where measurements are inaccurate. Yep. Th thank you for thank you for those tips. Now, we'll we'll talk it's uh, basics. Uh, we'll talk about decision making. Now, Ro Rohit Saxena has uh, had a lot of experience, and uh, and if and his uh, and his uh, his book his, that's uh, is is a, is is going to I think be a, a tremendous uh, benefit not only to trainees but also. To practicing ophthalmologists because it covers all the steps in surgery from basic to complex. But uh, uh, Ro uh, Rohit, uh, when you're uh, uh, making deci decision making uh, in your presentation, you uh, whoops, you're audible, sir. Go ahead, Rohit. Talk a little bit about your personal experiences in So uh, some of the things that has changed uh, how we operate is we moved to uh, using microscopes uh, and that I found has majorly changed the quality of outcome that we do. Among the things that you talked about on decision-making, so infants, yes, uh, bulk of it I still, I mean, would say we are using the Bruckner's reflex to get a good estimate of the deviation more often than not prisms are not possible and also we cross check our deviation when the child is under anesthesia so that is when the child is absolutely under anesthesia also gives us an idea about the basic deviation that the child has and uh, helps us to avoid gross surprises and uh, as i said we moved to the uh, microscope and helped us to reduce bleeding and damage to tissues and we that's why we moved to the fornix so that's those are key things. Amount of dissection, the key thing is be always consistent with the amount of dissection, your passage of sutures, your holding of the cut uh, insertion from the middle rather than from the end where you're going to measure and always make sure that you're perpendicular to the limbus so that there is no angle or rotation of your calipers and your measurements are accurate. So these, these tips, Whatever you do, always be consistent because that's how you will learn to evolve the amount of deviation correction you get per millimeter surgery that you do. Yeah, thank you. Now, and now, when you gave your, you gave some figures for minim, minimum and maximum. I was, I was uh, and looking at those. Uh, I thought they were very. You're very conservative in uh, that. You you don't do too much because uh, I know some surgeons. Uh, will recommend a seven millimeter recession of the media rectus and infantile esotropia. Now, you, you, your maximum was six, uh, yeah. which uh, I agree with. Why, why, can you explain why? So uh, there are two reasons in infants you need to be very careful. Firstly, when you're doing your measurements in infants, the anterior segment is not so well developed. You need to first measure where the muscle is inserted because sometimes the muscle insertion may not be 5.5 millimeters from the limbus so particularly in infants you need to measure that and then go beyond and do your measurements for amount of surgery and i do not go beyond six millimeters because i feel that there is a major risk of an adduction deficit and convergence which is very important for children so my upper limits are uh, six millimeters for medial rectus, and if required, then we do three muscles or a second sitting. But uh, I, I would feel that that is my upper limit for. Uh, in fact, it's even less if I'm operating Duan. So, in Duan's, I would say I would, uh, you know, even not uh, really want to go beyond 5.5 also because adduction deficit is a very major problem in uh, particularly Eso Duan's. So, 
Thank you very much. Now we've got two minutes left. Would any of the panelists like to ask questions of, of each other or make any closing comments? Well, if not, I'd like to thank all of you once again for an outstanding symposium and look forward to involving you in future symposium of APSROS. And, and I'd urge uh, anyone who's not a member of APSROS to, to join. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for being a part of 79th AIOC virtual conference. We conclude this hall for now. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.